Hello, hello, hello. I see you there. I'm so glad you're here. Stop scrolling. This is it. This is our moment together to learn the word of God together here. You have arrived. You have arrived. This is a divine appointment. I truly believe that. I truly believe that today here for you, if you just stop for a minute, I believe that you have been seeking for answers. I believe that maybe you are searching for something more. Well, I wanna tell you, this is a place where you're gonna find lots of answers. Hi, my name is Gio and this is Unraveled Hearts. We are doing the Unraveled Hearts a Bible study tonight. And so you are invited, get a seat because there's always a seat at the table. I'm so glad that you came to the virtual table, that you are here, that you are partaking in the study. If you're an actual table learning with others, that's wonderful. That's the best way to learn, okay? And so I'm gonna apologize ahead of time. I'm having a really bad hair day. It's winter, so heaters are in full swing here and my hair, is not adjusting to the heaters. It's like static, frizzy. Mm. And right before I came on, guess what I did? I popped a just a, a piece of chocolate in my mouth and I chewed it and then I realized, what the heck did I just do? I don't know why I, you know, it's one of those mindless things we do. Uh, you know, bad decisions, bad decisions. Okay, so anyway, I don't know what kind of hair you're having, what kind of bad, I don't know, bad day, bad hair, bad you know mood, bad attitude. I don't know what you're encountering. Maybe you're encountering bad attitudes around you. I don't know. The point is we're here now and things are going to get better from here on because we're studying God's word. We're together studying God's word. Tonight is the night. We're gonna make it happen, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to start unpacking some of God's truth here, the, the, the word of God, and partaking in really good stuff tonight. We're stuttering. We're stuttering? Oh, I am stuttering. We are studying Deuteronomy 14. Deuteronomy 14. We're at part two of this. We started the very first two verses last week. So if you want to take a look at that, by all means. But right now we're gonna we're gonna move forward in verse three. But we always start with a proverb. We start with a proverb first. So why don't you meet us there? Go to the book of Proverbs. That's right like a little after the book of Psalms. In the book of Psalms, we learned that the book of Psalms, you just open it right smack in the middle. And voila, you have the book of Psalms, uh, of Psalms, and then you have the Proverbs. You just go a little bit forward, and yeah, uh, we use the Bible. We use actual pages, actual book. <laughs> Imagine that. 2022 is not going to stop us from digging in the Word of God through the actual Bible because it helps us navigate. It helps us learn. It helps us move along knowing the books of the Bible, kind of getting our, you know, calluses. Isn't it awesome to have calluses because you're searching, your Bible is on fire as you're going through through scripture. It's awesome to know it without internet, without an app, without distractions or anything pulling us or the world pulling us, we're gonna focus. But first, we're gonna pray because I have 2.5 shots of espresso in me, okay? Need I say more? I need to calm down, although I may need to need it to get everything out because there's so much and I want to make sure we get it all in. But aside from, you know, my espresso shots, some of you may, I don't know, have junk from work, junk from personal life, junk from people, spirits that have attached to you, demons all over you. <laughs> um, Anyway, we'll just pray right now and we'll cast stuff out, send it away, and we will settle our minds and hearts right now so that we can learn the most that we can possibly learn tonight from God's word at the table. Let's do that. And Father God, I thank you. I thank you for every soul that is within earshot, God. 
every person that is listening to me right now that's within the sound of my voice, God. I ask that Holy Spirit penetrate every room, every house, every building, every vehicle, every, every part of their surroundings, God that your presence will just consume them right now in the mighty name of Jesus, that your presence like a cloud will come and be all around that we can learn from the cloud that is you, from your presence, God. That's where we want to learn. We want to grow from there, that you can be doing great and mighty things even as we learn. We believe that, God, that even as we're seeking your word, Bones will be aligned, backs will be completely healed, eyes will be open, prodigals will be coming home, miracles will happen even as we're studying the Word of God, as we're partaking in you, Father God. I know that things can happen, so I pray, Lord God, that as people are coming and they're gathering and, and they're getting settled at the table, that you still their minds, that you still their hearts that you give them a hunger and thirst like never before, that they're able to have ears that really hear, to have eyes that really see, maybe for the very first time, God. I pray for revelation, the spirit of revelation to go forth in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray for Holy Spirit, you have your way. May you have your way in this moment as we come near to God and we try and learn of Him and His character and what he has for us tonight, God. I pray for peace and stillness and joy. And I pray, Lord God, that tonight you impart something powerful inside each, each one of us tonight, God. Thank you, God. May learning take place tonight in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We are ready. We are ready to roll up our sleeves and get to work. Let's get to work, okay? So... Oh my goodness, I have an awkward setup right here. Usually I there's two tables connected and there's like stuff right in between. Anyway, I've got I am straddling the tables what I'm saying. So that's okay. Uh, sometimes I might, you know, um uh, uh bang up against the camera here, but it's fine. It'll be fine. This is good. This is a good time to learn. Let's get right into it. All right. Proverbs we're gonna take part in cheese and crackers. So that's our appetizer. We're learning from the book of Proverbs. We're in verse uh, 14, or chapter 14, verse seven. Chapter 14, verse seven. So for six years, we have been studying a proverb, proverb by proverb every week, and we're at 14, seven, and the proverbs never disappoint. There's always treasure, there's always gold there, and it helps us. It helps us kind of whet our appetite for what is to come. And there's so much, I mean, I am, this is job security for me as a Bible teacher. Like there is never, it's never ending learning, never ending teaching. Thank you, God. All right. So I break up the proverb. I break it up with the Geneva, with the King James, and with the New Living Translation. So um, in order to do that, and, and the reason I do that is one, the translations are um, closer to the Hebrew and um, the, the, the Hebrew, right? Because we're in the Old Testament. They're closer to the Hebrew. And so then you will find that the meaning, sometimes as we get further away from authentic or or um, the, the, the closer the translation, the better, right? As we get further away from that, the meaning changes, the power changes. So the, the, the power of the word changes. And so we wanna, we wanna check this out. And that's why I like to add the New Living Translation because one, it's common folk. It's very easy to understand and read. But at the same time, when we compare it to other older translations or, uh, or, or uh, closer to the Hebrew translations, we begin to see, wow, there is a difference there, okay? And it's good for us to, to know that. Every time I get on here, my nose itches. I don't know what's going on. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. I, I love winter and this is winter time and I absolutely love, love the, the frigid cold. I have enjoyed the frigid cold. I have enjoyed the snow. I have enjoyed the ice. I, I enjoy my face being completely frozen the minute I walk outside. But I do not enjoy 
the heaters everywhere. They just, they make me stuffy and they make my hair all staticky and my hair's not adjusting well to it. But anyway, Proverbs 14, verse seven, okay? Here we go. I have a new King James. I'm gonna read it first. At any point, if you need to pause, I think it's vital, especially if you're learning with other people at the table, to pause the video and read it out loud. When you read the word of God out loud, it changes the atmosphere. It is God. You see, Jesus is the word. The word became flesh. So you are literally just pouring out Jesus in the room. You want to hear God speak? Read the word of God out loud. Okay, 14.7. Go from the presence of a foolish man when you do not perceive in him the lips of knowledge. Woo! We're, we're, this is good. This is good. We're going to get right in it. The Geneva translation reads like this. 14, Proverbs 14, verse 7. Depart from the foolish man when thou perceivest, perceivest, right? The old English not in him the lips of knowledge, okay? So we have this foolish man, okay? So foolish man. So what is that? Who is that? Well, how do you describe a foolish man? Well, I went to the, you know, uh, uh, yes, we go to the word of God for, the, for a translation. So a fool is someone who doesn't know God. And then a foolish man, so the characteristics of, of a fool, foolish man, He's void of understanding or sound judgment. I went to the King James um, Bible Dictionary. Void of understanding or sound judgment, weak in intellect, okay? Ladies, pay attention to that, okay? Because sometimes, uh, you know, physical, spiritual, we want big muscles in the spiritual, ladies. <laughs> Please do not be deceived. And strong um, in the mind, intellect, okay? A foolish man is weak intellectually, okay? And applied to the general character. Um, ridiculous, a foolish man is ridiculous, is despicable. In scripture, is wicked and sinful, okay? If a man is in sin, he's a foolish man, okay? Now, perceive. What does it mean to perceive? So we know we depart a foolish man when thou perceive not in him the lips of knowledge. So perceive, to know, to know, to understand, to observe. Um, so a lot of times for women, it's like we have this intuition, women's intuition that we need to pay attention to. We need to, um, that's perception. We're perceiving something, okay? to understand something at a different level, to know. It's like you don't know. You, it's a knower. You don't know how you know. You know. I used to tell my my kids and, and kids that I would teach, you know, when, when my girls were little, I would say, you know, you know when you're knower. <laughs> uh, you know, to, to have them understand the Holy Spirit speaking inside of them. Sometimes it's difficult for children to understand that if they have the, the Holy Spirit leading them. So I would say you have a knower inside of you. And that knower, you know, if, if, if that knower is telling you, you know, this person is not a good person or stay away from this person or listen to that. That's your, your gut for a better, for a lack of a better word here. We can also use that. No lips of knowledge. What does that mean? When a foolish man has no lips of knowledge, what does that mean? Lips, your lips are a vehicle for truth. Hallelujah. They're a vehicle for truth or they can be a vehicle for lies. Okay. Deception death, or they can be a vehicle for wisdom, life, okay? Oh, the living water can run through your lips, but right now we're talking about no lips of knowledge, so think about that. What does that mean? Not, not life coming out of them, uh, not, not truth. Let's go to a proverb to teach us about a proverb, okay? Let's go to Proverbs 2015. Proverbs 2015 reads, There is gold and, and a multitude of rubies, 
but the lips of knowledge are pre are a precious jewel. Okay, and then um, I think I have it at ESV. Okay, there's gold and a multitude of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. This is Proverbs 2015. There's one where it says, the, the, the lips of knowledge are a rare jewel, okay? I, I would rather have lips that speak truth, lips that speak life. That is more precious than a jewel, more rare than jewels, than to have a beautiful diamonds around your neck. So, um, okay, so we've got this understanding here that a foolish man has no lips of knowledge and we will perceive that, especially for people of God, we will perceive that Holy Spirit will let us know. King James, verse seven, go, uh, 14, Proverbs 14, verse seven, go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceiveth not in him the lips of knowledge, okay? So here uh, in the Geneva, it said, um, ah, quick, quick, quick. The Geneva, it says, depart, okay? But watch this. The King James says, it's that chocolate, you guys. Ah, I'm, just, I'm drinking so much water. Okay, but the King James says, go from the presence. I think that's even like more powerful. Go from the presence. Nowhere around. You don't want this man, this foolish man, anywhere around you, okay? And I'm saying man, but it could be a foolish woman, okay? Man or woman, person. You don't want to be around the presence. Nowhere around. Do not even be in view. That's from the present. Do not be in view or in sight of that person. That's too close. Do not be near this person, okay? And then the Living Bible, the New Living Translation in verse 7, 14, Proverbs 14, 7. Stay away from fools, for you won't find knowledge on their lips. So don't even wait to perceive. Just stay away. Stay away. Okay, there's great treasure here. And some of you probably... As we're talking about this, you're being reminded of people or, or God is bringing things to mind that, that will help you, right? That, that, are, that uh, God is saying, red flag, red flag, right? Saying, stay away, depart, um, do not go into this person's presence. They're bringing people to mind right now because God's trying to protect you. So I know that some of you have stories or things to share or things that you're pondering even as you're thinking about this. So you can certainly pause the video now and have a discussion within your group, a short discussion of what this proverb is, is bringing up in your mind and your heart, what Holy Spirit is stirring up inside of you because there's great treasure in this verse, okay? Here are my two cents regarding this proverb. It is important to God that we stay away from those who speak lies and those who are deceitful, okay? It's important to God. Why? Why is it so important to God? Shouldn't we as truth bearers, you know, we are people of light. We are carriers of God's presence. We are the temple of God. Shouldn't we, able, we be able to withstand such a person? not be bothered or disturbed by this foolish person? Why do we have to depart? Why do we have to flee from their presence? Why do we have to stay away from such a person? Okay, that's something to pay attention to. Defilement, pollution, pollution in our spirit, in our mind, our heart, uncleanliness is what God, God desires for us to be holy, right? So what it does to our spirit, our heart, our mind is often difficult for even the children of God to deal with. He doesn't want us having to deal with that, with that constantly. The enemy is wanting to steal your peace. Constantly, he wants to kill your joy, to destroy your testimony. You must be on guard and set boundaries to protect 
the incredible fruits of the Spirit. These incredible fruits, you know, the peace and joy, they're fruits of the Spirit. You don't need to be part of unnecessary battles that the Lord through his word, even right now, has warned us to stay away from. We must be on guard and heed God's word. When you associate with liars, with deceivers, when you partake in deceitful conversations, when you hear lies and words of death, even if you're not fully engaged and participating in the conversation, you will be affected in a negative way. Your spirit, your soul, your mind, that's the target of these individuals that the enemy uses to bring you down and ultimately destroy you. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Let's go to John 14, 1. So John is in the New Testament. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the fourth book. And let's go to John 14, verse 1. And I had a dear friend just really speak this to me. And, and then, you know, now that I'm using it, the problem, I'm like, oh my goodness. Yes, yes. It says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God and believe also in me. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. John 14, 1. So this is Jesus. These are red letters. Jesus telling us, do not let your heart be troubled. Protect yourself. Guard your heart. Don't let it be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me, Jesus says. And now let's go to... Uh, 2 Corinthians 10.5, 2 Corinthians 10.5, because yes, we have to guard our heart, but we also have to guard our mind, okay? So 2 Corinthians is after 1 Corinthians. <laughs> is that helpful? Okay, First, I mean, 2 Corinthians 10.5 reads, this is Paul trying to teach us something here. Let's pay attention. Casting down arguments, sometimes it says imaginations, thoughts, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Paul is telling us to do something here. He wouldn't be telling us if it was not possible to do it. He says, you need to take these things captive. They're going to try and attack your mind and you need to bring them, you know, into captivity because there are thoughts and there are imaginations and there are arguments, there are conversations that are going to want to exalt themselves above the knowledge of God. Imagine that. Well, that's Lucifer himself, right? That's the enemy. So we don't allow that. We guard our heart. We guard our mind. Thank you, Jesus. Anytime God's word lays, lays out instructions, specific instructions at that, it's for our own good. It's for our own good. God desires for us to be walking in joy and peace. Okay, if we flee the presence of a foolish man and we run to the presence of a man who is truth, <laughs> a man who bled for us, who died for us, we can experience life and life more abundantly. I would rather run to the presence of my Jesus than any other man. Flee from the presence of a foolish man. Ladies and men everywhere, flee from the presence of a foolish person. All right, how about that? How about them apples? That was nice. That was a nice little appetizer. Let's go to Deuteronomy. Meet me there. Deuteronomy 14. And we are just about to embark deeper into this... Um, in this chapter, okay? Moses is speaking to the Israelites here and he's giving them wisdom as they go into 
they're about to embark to the promised land. And so I don't, I didn't have it quite ready. So I'm here. So he's giving them instructions. He's speaking to them. He's saying, please listen, um, obey, you know, what God has, has told us. And so right here, he's, he's talking to him. He, he talked to them last week about what, what did we talk about last week? You are different. You are to be different. You are to be set apart. So how we deal with grieving and pain is what we discussed last week, that even in that way, we are to be different because we are a people who are not without hope. Our hope is in Jesus. Now we're going to start right in verse three. Okay. So let's read that 14 verse three. You shall not eat any detestable thing. Okay, so let's start there. <laughs> Clearly, it states that we are not to eat anything that was an abomination. Okay, the Geneva, the King James reads abomination. Here, I had uh, it read this detestable thing. Okay, but for most translations, it will say, and more correctly, abomination. Okay. That's a big word. What is abomination? What does it mean? Okay. It's not the marble character, you guys. We're not talking about that. So according to the King James Dictionary, um, abomination is extreme hatred, disgust, defilement, uh, pollution. Okay. So this... He's saying, do not eat an abomination, something that is God does not like, he's disgusted by, he considers it a defilement and pollution, okay? This verse sounds like there's food that God hates and wants us to stay away from, right? That's what it sounds like here. And picky eaters everywhere right now are saying, I knew it, I knew it. It's Brussels sprouts for sure, right? Or in, in my family, it's onions, right? Onion haters, perhaps you're thinking it, it's got to be onions or, or liver or liver and onions, right? For sure. Who would possibly like that? Who could possibly like liver and onions? Not even God. <laughs> Listen, I want to shout out to my friend Lana Rubio who loves liver and onions. And so I'm so proud of her because that's extremely good. It's extremely rich in iron and good for you. And she likes that. And I hope she's passing that down to her girls. Uh, and I assure you, Lana, there's nothing wrong with you. Uh, but so, so for picky eaters, you're like, for sure, there are some things we need to stay away from. But what if you're a foodie? I'm a foodie. What if you're a foodie like me? I love all foods, okay? My mom raised me well. I will try anything and I'm always open to trying, you know, cooking, um, cooking new things or eating new things, new cu cuisines. And I love, I'm the kid that loves my vegetables. Yes, I was that kid. Um, and you know, nowadays you, the uh, parents are like short order cooks. What would you like? What would you know? Like my parents placed a plate in front of me. You better eat it. And, and I did. And I did. Okay. So for our foodies, this verse can be disheartening <laughs> because you're, you're already thinking, Oh no, Oh no, what foods? And, and I probably already ate them. So, uh, what do you mean? There's food that God hates. <laughs> what do you mean there's food that he doesn't want us to eat in order to be holy? Okay, all right, all right. Well, what if I told you that this verse and this lesson about unclean and clean foods was not so much about food, but rather God's desire for his people to be separate? God's desire for his people to be his children. God's desire for his people to be different. Okay? Let me give you some proof of that. All right? It's important to analyze and examine the spirit of the law. Okay? 
what is the heart of God behind these laws? What should be ours? What is God calling us to? What is the purpose of this law? So we've got to lay some groundwork, okay, here so we can approach the study rightfully. We study the word of God always through the lens of the gospel. Let's study the spirit of the law, not just the letter of the law, okay? Let's go to Matthew, Matthew is the first book of the New Testament, Matthew 6.25. Matthew 6.25. Okay. And it reads, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear, isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Wow. Jesus is always calling us deeper. He's calling us deeper in this moment here. He tells us our focus should not be on these things. He's asking us to examine our lives. Isn't life more than food? Isn't life more than clothing? He is an excellent teacher. He's always teaching through questions. Let's go to Mark 7, Matthew, Mark. Let's go to Mark 7, 15 through 22. Okay. Okay, let me give you a little backstory here. Mark 7, 15 through 22. Here, the disciples were not washing their hands properly, okay? Now we're, we're like post-COVID, everybody's like freaking out about washing their hands. I was always a freak about washing our hands. That's why my kids never really got sick and, and uh, growing up, they were pretty healthy and, and I was a pretty healthy uh, person and adult uh, because that was always a thing for me. I like washing my hands. Here's the thing. Um, at that time, it was a law to wash your hands a certain way. It was a, a ritual. You see, there were laws that God had put in place, and then there were men's laws, the, the religious leaders that put laws on top of those laws and on top of those laws because that's how they controlled people. So they had a way of washing the hands that was... Um, just right uh, for, th they believe was just right for everybody and everybody should do it. So when they notice the disciples not doing that, not following that, and, and, and looking at them like, ooh, they're gross and they're eating with dirty hands. Okay, this is what, what, what's going on. And so they're, they're accusing, they're criticizing, they're, they're judging uh, the disciples. And watch what Jesus says. Oh, I love Jesus. I love his personality. I love the way he taught and argued and 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 set forth uh, truth. You know, he he just he just truth bombed everybody. Okay, so he said this. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes out of your heart. So he was calling them out right then and there, right? What you're saying is mean. What you're saying is horrible. It's coming from your heart and that's defiling you, okay? I'm throwing in there, if I was Jesus' assistant, I would probably be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so anyway, he says, what comes out of your heart? Then Jesus went into a house to get away from the crowd and his disciples asked him what he meant by the parable he just used, okay? All right, so these guys have been walking with Jesus. They have been listening to him. They are, uh, you know, they, they sleep um, around him. They, they eat with him. They're with him all the time. And yet they didn't understand what he was saying at this moment. And uh, understand they didn't have the Holy Spirit, you know? So, so a lot of it, it was 
Jesus having to explain to them certain things, okay? So here they're saying this. So don't be afraid of your questions is what I'm saying. As long as you've walked with Jesus, as long as you think, why am I having, it's okay. It's all right to have these questions. Holy Spirit will help you and so will other believers in the faith and, and the spirit of revelation will, will come upon you as well. So then Jesus went into the house to get away. The disciples said, what did you mean? And verse 18, he says, don't you understand either, he asked. Can't you see that the food you put into your body cannot defile you? Wow, wow. Okay, keep in mind, Deuteronomy. We're just reading Deuteronomy. So, so, so you know, trek with me, trek with me here. It's important that you see this. Can't you see that the food you put in your body cannot defile you? Food doesn't go into your heart, but only passes through your stomach and then goes into the sewer. Well, that's the New Living Translation right there. It, it comes out of you. You poop it out. Okay, verse 20. And then he added, it, it is what comes from inside inside that defiles you from within out of a person's heart come evil thoughts sexual immorality theft murder adultery greed wickedness deceit lustful desires envy slander pride and foolishness man he could have gone on and on and on because it first has to be a thought. It has to enter our thought life. It has to penetrate the heart, and then it becomes action. It, be it becomes behavior. It becomes a habit. It becomes an addiction. So he, he's, he, he's teaching us, guys. He's teaching us something here. He's laying this down. It's the spirit, the spirit of the law, okay? First off, Jesus is letting us know straight off that not everyone who has ears can hear. He's talking about spiritual hearing, a level of understanding, a different level of understanding. Let him who has ears hear. Let him, let him who have ears to hear, hear. Not everyone who has ears to hear actually hear. He knew not everyone was going to get this. So I'm praying the same thing for you right now. May you have ears to hear at this moment. But don't get discouraged because even the disciples struggled with this. They had a hard time with this. It is not what enters a person that defiles a person. It is what comes out of a person via their thoughts, mouth, behaviors, even things right from their heart that can defile a man. Defiles... To defile means to make unclean, impure, pollute, corrupt, to taint. Jesus was talking about inward defilement. Man could be defiled, made unclean from the inside out only. It was about the soul. It is a heart issue. So why this law? God placed the law to keep us safe, to show himself, to keep our hearts pure, to make us different, to make us set apart, to show a distinction, to show a difference between the kingdom of God and this world around us. Let's look at the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law, okay? The spirit of the law when it comes to adultery. Let's go to Matthew 5, okay? Matthew 5, and stay in this book because we're going to be there. Matthew 5, 27 through 28. So he's teaching them about adultery here, or he's, he's, he's sharing something here that's powerful. And he says in Matthew 5, 27 through 28, he says, You have heard it said... So he's talking to people who know. You have heard it said, you should not commit adultery, okay? That's the law. I mean, if you didn't know that, you know now the word of God says, do not commit adultery. If you are married, you are not to be sleeping around with somebody else, okay? In case you didn't know, 
let me give you some revelation right now. Okay, so he said, you have heard it said. Most of us have, right? But I tell you, Jesus is calling us further. Jesus is calling us deeper. Jesus says, but I tell you, he walked on this earth to show us the spirit of the law. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Wow. Wow. Jesus said it's not about the act. You don't have to go all the way. It starts here. And if you've already thought it, you've already done it, and you've already, that's pollution in the heart. That's already defilement in the heart. You've already sinned. It's the spirit, the spirit of the law, right? So have you ever looked at another person lustfully and I can confess to you right here, right now, absolutely I have. I have looked at a man and thought lustful thoughts about another man. That was not my husband. So I have, by the definition here in the word of God, through Jesus, the man of truth, I'm confessing to you that I have committed adultery. And then he goes further here. He talks about murder or anger. And he says, in Matthew 5, 21 through 22, it says, you have heard that our ancestors were, to were told, so here we are again, you must not murder. And we've, we've heard that, right? In case you haven't heard, spirit of revelation, here it comes. Do not kill people. Do not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, Jesus says, I'm going to take you deeper. I'm going to take you further. If you are even angry with someone, you are subject to that same judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. If you curse someone, if you have hatred in your heart towards someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. Calling us deeper. The spirit of murder is in your heart. You are committing murder in your heart if you have done these things. So according to Jesus, I am a murderer. I am an adulterer and I am a murderer because there have been times when I have hated on people, when my anger has overruled my, my spirit and my compassion. And yes, I have uh, been angry and sinned or I have had hatred in my heart. So those are things that I have had to repent from, turn away. I am not a sinner any longer as far as adultery and murder are. You repent. That's as easy as that. You turn away. You realize what you're doing. You realize what is in your heart, the sin that you're committing, and you turn and you turn uh, uh, and you go another way and you ask the Lord to help you. You repent. You say, no more. I changed my mind. That's not who I'm going to be. That's not what I'm going to do. I want to be holy. I want to be different. The Geneva Bible, oh, regarding anger, uh, it talks about unadvisedly being angry in an unwise manner, in a rash manner, okay? So operating by your emotions. The spirit of the law. The difference about the spirit of the law is that it brings forth repentance. When, when you realize, wow, I don't want to hurt the heart of God. I don't want to do this. I don't want to have this in my heart. I don't want to be unclean from the inside out. I don't want to have these thoughts. I don't want to have this in my heart. And it draws you to the Lord. The letter of the law, if you're trying to obey the letter of the law, that keeps you in bondage. That is religion. It shames you. It keeps you in a place of superficiality because now you want to appear, you try so hard to appear clean on the outside and show the outside of the cup. What do I mean by the outside of the cup? What am I talking about? Well, Jesus said it best. Let's go to Matthew 23. 25 through 28. Matthew 23, 25 through 28. Okay? 
What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are so, this is Jesus talking by the way, for you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, First, wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law, those teaching the letter of the law, and you Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled with on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurities. Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Whoa. Jesus just let him have it. Boom, boom. Truth bombs, karate chop. Truth. James makes it clear. James 1.22, he says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. You know, going to church every Sunday, being like a little puppy dog on the, the dashboard and just, yes, yes, amen, amen. You're hearing it and the minute you walk away, the minute the sermon's over, you are not doers of the word. You are not spending time or in the word enough for it to change you, to transform you from the inside out. Hallelujah. So you're deceiving yourselves. You're deceiving yourselves. How do you, how do you stay away from yourself? We said stay away from a foolish man, a man who's deceitful, who's lying. What if it's you that's lying to you? You're deceiving yourself. You have to change. You have to repent. You have to be transformed. You have to become a new person because you can't get away from you. Let's go to Deuteronomy verse four through five, hoping we have enough time here. Deuteronomy, so we're back in the chapter we're studying, okay? Now, is it like you're, you're, uh, you're remembering, oh yeah, we were in Deuteronomy 14, that's right. Okay, oh dear, Deuteronomy 14, verse four through five. These are the animals which you may eat, the ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the roe deer, the wild goat, the mountain goat, the antelope, the mountain sheep. Okay, so for some of you, it listed some names of animals you didn't understand. But I think the New King James did a good job of just kind of making that more common. And then I'm going to read it, read a list here to make sure we don't miss it. The animals that uh, God told them, hey, you can eat from these animals. Um, and it was the ox, which we studied in the Proverbs last week. Ox is just cattle. It's all types of cattle, big cattle. Okay. Sheep, goats, deer, gazelle, roe, deer. For some of you hunters, you might clarify in the comments, what's a roe deer? A wild goat, adax, antelope, and mountain sheep. Okay. So that's the list. Let's go to verse six. And you may eat every animal with cloven hoofs, having a hoof split into two parts that choose the cud among the animals. So these two characteristics here. Here in this verse, God describes two important characteristics, okay? So what, what is different about all these animals that he's allowing them to eat? But here are the difference. These animals have, um, in order to partake from eating, they have to have... Um, um, these, these characteristics in case there's more questions, like, are we supposed to eat it? Maybe they don't know what animal it is, but here are the characteristics. One, it must be complete splitted hoof. Okay. So their, their paws, their feet, their, their, yeah. So they have to be splitted, completely, uh, uh, split hoofs divided. It must chew the cud. What does that mean? If you've never heard of that, Chew the cud. What does that mean? What does it, what does it mean for an animal to chew the cud? 
okay? Well, back in Leviticus, when we first, when I first came across this and really dove into studying it, I found it fascinating and, and it's just simple. What it is, is an animal that eats, chews their food, regurgitates it back up, chews it some more, regurgitates it, and it can be a process up to four times, several times. So every time they're chewing it, every time they're, you know, you'll see a cow just kind of sitting there going, what are they eating? Well, they just regurgitated their food and they're chewing it again, okay? They're getting the most nutrients. They're getting the most out of that food. Okay, and and the 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 ugly, the waste, the toxins are being removed, whereas the nutrients are all being absorbed, and 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 just, they're just really working on that food to make it to make it as as a nutrients as possible, getting all the nutrients out and and using as much of the nutrients inside their body. Okay. So when animals such as cows or sheep chew the cud, they slowly chew their partially digested food over and over again in their mouth before finally swallowing it, okay? So these are the two distinct signs that God um, gave the Israelites. So there would be no confusion as to what they were allowed to eat and what they were not, okay? This is super interesting. This is super interesting, I'm sure man, that there's layers and layers. If, if we camped out here, like in these verses, if we camped out right here, I bet we could get weeks and weeks and wonderful series of sermons just in this. There's just so much here to help us spiritually look at this, okay? But we, in the very least right now, for the sake of this lesson and this study, we need to notice that there's a, spirit, a spiritual connotation. There's a connection here to the spiritual, a hidden meaning, if you will, for us regarding our own spiritual food, okay? So we talked about the divided hooves, right? The divided uh, 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 paws. I don't know what about that hooves, okay? It must be, so, so when we look at that, the food, these animals were to be their food, okay? And they needed to be rightly uh, divided, okay? Now let's look at where the rightly divided, you may have heard of this in the word of God. What, what else do we, our spiritual food is the word of God and what does he say about the word being rightfully divided? So it must be, that that's one characteristic. It must be correctly divided. The truth must be correctly divided. Second Timothy 2.15, I'm gonna read it in the Geneva translation, in the King James translation, so we have 2 Timothy 2.15, and Paul is explaining this. He says, he's telling Timothy, his protege, his young, uh, up-and-coming, um, you know, man who's going to, to carry the gospel further, um, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, dividing the word of God right. King James says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightfully dividing the word of truth. Dividing the word of truth. Much like the hoofs, animals completely split, divided. We need to boom, open it up. Let's divide it. Let's, let's really look at it. Let's dissect it. Let's, let's really dive in and unpack it. Okay, rightfully dividing the word of truth. There's a division component about the word of God that Paul teaches us throughout the New Testament. Not only rightfully dividing it, um, divide, but very meticulously. It, it's uh, the the not, not only dividing the word, but the word of God very meticulously is used like a scalpel, like like. Like a surgeon, you know, a surgeon uses a scalpel to divide things in us, to cut away, to separate those things inside of us that need to be removed for spiritual growth, for healing, okay? And he explains this in Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, 
piercing to the division of the soul and of the spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It goes right down to the matter of things. Wow, okay? So we see how this div this division uh, rightfully divided in an animal that was to be their physical food. Now we're talking about spiritual food, how important that is for us. Now, what about chewing the cud? When it comes to spiritual food, that can pertain to carefully chewing, meditating, studying, seeking the word of God. As students and teachers of the word, we must be chewing the cud, taking the word of God in daily, pondering, questioning, going to God with it, learning, taking in as much spiritual nutrients as possible. Let's go to Psalms. Remember, right in the middle of your Bible, Psalms 1-2. Psalms 1-2. But his delight, who is, who is he talking about? Us, us. Those that love the Lord, those that are his children, those that are believers. Our delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. We meditate day and night. Like the word of God, we should fall in love with it, right? And it should meditate in it day and night. We're thinking about it. We're pondering. We're chewing the cut. Psalms 119, 11. Psalms 119, 11. I have stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Okay, we talked about in the Proverbs that we need to guard ourselves, guard our hearts, and guard our mind. Well, the word of God is the best thing, and we need to put that. That needs to go deep inside of us. We need to chew the cud. We need to meditate upon it so it's stored up in our heart so that we do not sin against God. Hallelujah. Joshua 1.8 Joshua 1 8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you might be careful to do according to what is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. You want it to be well with you. You got to get this word inside of you. You got to chew the cud as Joshua 1 8 says. I want to encourage you to be a diligent student of the word. Chew the cud for that is the word that will sustain you. It's the word of God that will sustain you. And when you teach and share the word, because that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be teaching and sharing the word, making disciples that make disciples that make disciples. The word that's inside of you will be the word that will be edifying for you will have spent time in it, meditating upon it, absorbing as much revelation as possible, and then presenting it as good spiritual food for the body of Christ to consume. We come back around to this choosing your teachers wisely, paying attention that they are rightfully dividing the word of God, that they are people in love with God's word, spending plenty of time chewing the cud of the spiritual food that you get to eat. The physical always speaks of the invisible, the spiritual. So it's no difference here. I brought you as far as I could bring you tonight. Next week, we will discuss the food the Israelites were not to eat. Some of you are saying right now, uh, I think I have partaken of some spiritual junk food. You, you're, you're starting to realize, oh man, this if this speaks to the spiritual, I have taken in some spiritual junk food. All of my life, for some of you, all of your life. Like you're realizing, like, I need to be a better student of the word. I'm not a student of the word, some of you are realizing. And for that reason, throughout your life, 
You've been deceived. You've believed lies. Lies from the enemy. Well, let me tell you that there's hope. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Jesus came to make all things new, to set you free, to set you free from your mind, even the religious chains that have held you captive, even the mistakes, even not operating by the spirit of the law, being defiled from the inside out. Oh goodness, Jesus calls us deeper and further and I want you to encounter him tonight. I want you to know that he waits for you with open arms. He desires you. He is the only way to God. If you want to call God your father, if you want to be a child of God, you must know and believe in Jesus. Jesus bled and died for you so that you may have eternal life. He shed his blood so that every sin from the perfect lamb of God could be covered. That means you are forgiven. That means a debt that you could not pay is now paid. Hallelujah. You need to step into that. You need to believe that. You need to surrender your life to him. Give him permission to have full access to your life. You've got to take a big step here. You've got to repent. That means change your mind. You are going your own way. Perhaps you're walking in darkness or in sin. Turn away. You are repenting. You're going another way. You're now following Jesus. That is your past. You're wanting to shed it off. And that is not who you are anymore. You want Jesus to come in and he will give you a new heart. He will make you a new creation. Holy Spirit will fill you up. As soon as you receive the gift of eternal life and receive that new heart as you surrender and you repent before God right now, Holy Spirit can fill you up right now in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, just fill them up right now. Fill them up. Consume them. Consume them, God. Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God, fill them up. Fill them up. May they walk differently. May they speak differently. Give them, give them revelation. Give them the spirit of revelation. Holy Spirit, lead them. Holy Spirit, point them to Jesus. Point them to the cross. Holy Spirit, coach them, comfort them, teach them, and help them. Holy Spirit is the greatest helper. You can call on him day and night. He will help you study the word of God. He will help you with revelation. Father God, I just thank you. I thank you for this moment. I thank you for the people that have come to know you in a different way, in a powerful way. I thank you for those that are making you their Lord, their Savior right now, are stepping into a new life right now. In the name of Jesus, I thank you, God, for them. I ask that you be with them, Father God. May you surround them with living uh, vessels of God that will instruct them and teach them and grow them. In the name of Jesus, place them, God, lead them to a, a one wonderful church that teaches your name, God, that teaches what you have them to teach, Father God. Thank you for the eyes that were open, the ears that were open tonight. Thank you for revelation. May this word continue to grow inside of us, God. Thank you for everyone that has come to the table. Bless them, God. Help them to digest this. Help them to chew the cud on this, God. Help them to grow spiritually, God. I thank you for healings and supernatural things that happened in the background, healings that took place even during this lesson. I thank you, God. You are a powerful God. We believe you, God. We will follow you all the days of our life. Thank you for this moment. In Jesus' name, Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you, and I hope to see you back at the table real soon.